Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to this service of worship. My name is Kristen Hanna. I'm one of the pastors appointed here to Christ UMC. Pastor Ben has enjoyed a wonderful spring break with his family and is resting up today, but he will be back among us this week. Um, we'll get into some announcements at the close of the service, but everything you need for worship is a bulletin, which the ushers gave you out in the narthex, as well as a hymnal that's in the pew back in front of you, and everything else we need will come up on the screen. So with that, I invite you to rise as you are able as we join in our call to worship. Bring your doubts and your fears. God's goodness is big enough to hold them. Bring your wanderings and your curiosity. God's faithfulness is wide enough to contain them. Bring your whole self this day. God's love is vast enough to embrace you, all of you. Friends, as we remain standing, let us join in singing our opening hymn, Christ is Alive. It can be found on page 318 of the United Methodist Hymnal, and the words will also come up on the screen. And you may be seated. And will you join me in a spirit of prayer? God of love, there are so many words in a day. To-do lists and stress, self-talk and notifications. There are so many words, and yet the only words we really need are yours. So today we pray, drown out every voice but your own. With gratitude, we ask this of you. Amen. Our Psalter lesson today comes from Psalm 133. It might be the shortest Psalter lesson we've done in a while. We will join in singing a refrain together in unison, and then we'll read the text responsively as it comes up on the screen. at how good and pleasing it is when families dwell together as one. It is like expensive oil 
poured over the head, running down onto the beard, Aaron's beard, which extended over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, streaming down onto the mountains of Zion, because it is there that the Lord has commanded the blessing, everlasting life. Every week as we gather, it is a right and a good thing that we confess the ways in which we have broken God's best intentions for us. So friends, hear now this invitation. The risen Christ invites to his table all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with God and with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins together before God and one another. God of new life, we need Easter like the desert needs rain. For you give us unending love, and we turn it into a commodity. You give us mystery, and we force it into certainty. You give us community, and we set rules about who is in and who is out. You give us grace, but we hold grudges against our neighbors. You give us light, and we ration it out to those we believe deserve it. God of grace, forgive us for our shortcomings. Dwell among us like rain in the desert, holy and unexpected, until new life grows here. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. And having confessed together, we now offer our individual confessions in silence. Amen. And friends, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we prepare to receive our offering this day, just a word of thanksgiving to all of you. Um, if you were around during Lent, you know that it was our generosity series. In addition to being the season of Lent, um, we did the Climb Up series where we investigated the life of Zacchaeus probably more thoroughly than any other congregation ever has. Um, but we are so thankful for everyone who turned in a commitment card. Um, you cannot underestimate uh, the incredible good that your giving does in our community. It allows us to partner with organizations organizations like Table and Methodist Home for Children and IFC to really do more good than our individual congregation ever could do. So thank you. Uh, if you have not filled this out yet, uh, there's some out on the glass table in the narthex. You're welcome to take one. You can fill it out, bring it back next week, drop it by the office. Uh, there are lots of ways uh, to give to the church. So as our ushers get into place, let us pray together. Generous God, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you show up in our lives, both expected and unexpectedly. We ask that you would bless these gifts and the givers, that you would multiply the gifts given today, that all around the world would see glimpses of you and whoever they meet, and that they would know that you love them and care for them and hold them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths 
In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live The ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands.
And you may be seated. If there are any children or children at heart that would like to come up for our children's sermon, Heather, I see you're excited. Come on up. Um, and also for all of our kids who are joining us online, we are so glad you're here today. All right, Heather, I think I've had you look through this thing before, but I pulled it back out. This is called a Viewmaster. And when I was a kid, this is what we had instead of an iPad. So, you know, you could look through it and see all kinds of cool pictures. I want you to look through it and you can click that little side thing and see what you can see. Ooh, an eagle. You see an eagle. Do y'all believe her that she saw an eagle? Choir, do you believe her that she saw an eagle? <laughs> I'm seeing some doubts in our congregation this morning. Do y'all, do y'all think that Heather might have seen an eagle? Stingray. Oh, now she sees a stingray. I see. <laughs> so even though we can't see that you saw an eagle and a stingray, and I think at 9 o'clock they saw a frog, I trust you that you saw those things. <laughs> and in our story today, Jesus comes to his disciples, and one of them is missing. Thomas is not there, so he doesn't get to see Jesus. And so all of the disciples, when they see Thomas, they say, hey, Thomas, we've seen Jesus, and he's alive. Do you think Thomas believed them? No? Well, that's right. Thomas did not believe them. In fact, it took Jesus coming again to show Thomas that he was alive. But at the very end of the story, Jesus tells all of us, blessed are you who believe but have not seen. And that is a blessing for everybody because I haven't seen Jesus. Have you seen Jesus? No. No, but you believe in him, right? Yes. So that's a blessing for all of us. All right, friends, it's not the only way, but it's a good way. Let's close our hands and bow our heads and close our eyes and pray. Repeat after me. Dear God. Thank you for giving me faith to see you and help me to see you in others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friend, can I have my view master back? Good job, Heather. Thank you. <laughs> Well, friends, I invite you to rise in body, mind, or spirit for our gospel lesson today. We are picking right up where we left off last week in the gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. Let us hear what God is seeking to say to us this day. It was still the first day of the week. And that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks on his hands and put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands and put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. And Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. And then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And let us pray. Almighty God, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you've been around Christ UMC at all for the past season of Lent and came to our Lenten Lunch and Learn on Wednesdays, then you know 
that here in a mere couple of weeks, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church will be happening just down the road in Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, did you know that there is another general conference that is happening right now, as in quite literally, I think, as we are gathering here? This weekend marks the 194th biannual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, aka the Mormons. And if you've been around me for any length of time, then you might know that the Mormons are a kind of side hobby of mine. <laughs> I don't know how or when this started, maybe in college. Um, I remember as a kid driving by the LDS Temple in Dallas, which is a really bizarre looking building, kind of looks like a, a granite spaceship just sort of landed in the middle of a really affluent neighborhood. And I don't know if it started then, but at some point I began to wonder what kind of religion produces such a strange looking building and such nice people and generally such attractive people. <laughs> and you may be thinking, Pastor Kristen, don't we have enough drama in our own denomination that you don't really need to pay attention to the drama in another denomination? <laughs> well, friends, the answer to that question would be, of course I need to pay attention to the drama in another denomination. <laughs> Listen, pastors fall into one of two categories. We're either really cool or we're nerds. And I'm going to let you decide for yourself which one I fall into. But back to the Mormons. Uh, their general conference, while it shares a name with ours, um, that's about where the comparisons stop with these two gatherings. In fact, it's, it's well-known history that Joseph Smith, the founder of the LDS Church, liked the name that the Methodists had developed for their gatherings so much that he ripped it off and put it to use immediately in his own church. The LDS General Conference uh, differs from ours in several ways. For one, they happen twice a year, in April and in October. Ours only happens every four years. The LDS General Conference is always held in the Conference Center at Temple Square in downtown Salt Lake City, whereas ours moves around the country and hopefully someday will move around the world. But most importantly, the functions of these two denominational gatherings are wildly different. If you came to our Lunch and Learns, you know that for us United Methodists, this will be a time of working through legislation and policy. Lay and clergy alike will have voice and rep representation and will be able to vote. Uh, there are decisions that will be made communally uh, that will affect our day-to-day -day church life together. Now, for Mormons, General Conference is a time filled with what they call conference talks. Usually these are given by a general authority, uh, mostly men. Um, they're prepared speeches that can be really uplifting and encouraging and faith-promoting, and when they need to be, can be a little bit admonishing when appropriate. And sometimes a new church policy will be announced, as in decided from the top down, not voted on. Uh, the community doesn't really have a say in that. Uh, occasionally, the sitting prophet will announce a list of new temples that the church plans to build. Um, but from that, that's kind of it. It's talks and some announcements. Now, of course, if you're really into music, this is like the time to shine for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So it's always worth tuning in for that. But every year, twice a year, Mormons give up their weekend to watch all four sessions of General Conference. There's three on Saturday and one on Sunday. And they even cancel church on Sunday mornings because there's the expectation that you will be home with your family live streaming conference. So why do I bring all this up? Well, a few years ago, a general authority by the name of Dieter F. Uchtdorf gave a talk that caused a little bit of a stir. If I had to pick a favorite LDS church leader, I realize that's kind of strange to say from the pulpit, it would probably be uh, Dieter F. Uchtdorf. He's a retired German pilot. He's a man just full of joy from what I can tell. He really loves Jesus and the church and people. And he loves to tell stories about airplanes. Lots of stories about airplanes, like so many stories about airplanes. But this one particular talk of his is entitled, Come Join With Us. And it was addressed not only to potential members of the church, but at its heart, members who were struggling to see where they belonged in the community of Latter-day Saints. So about midway through his talk, Uchtdorf says the following. 
My dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends, please first doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. We must never allow doubt to hold us prisoner and keep us from the divine love, peace, and gifts that come through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Needless to say, this elicited quite a response from the faithful and the frustrated alike. The faithful went to work immediately implementing doubt your doubts in every way possible. I was curious, so this week I did a little cursory look online, and you can get this quote, doubt your doubts, on a variety of things. You can get it on t-shirts, bookmarks, one of those wall decals, um, funny enough, a coffee mug. If you know anything about the Mormons, you know that they don't drink coffee, so that one is a little above me. You can get it on stickers, on journals, on wall art, stamped jewelry, and the list goes on and on and on. Those who believed were all in when Ukdorf said these words. But for those on the margins, perhaps with one foot in and one foot out of the church, they felt the chasm of their faith grow even deeper and wider at the sound of his voice. Doubt your doubts. I wonder what doubting Thomas would think of all this. I love Thomas. I mean, he's just so real, isn't he? As much as I would like to believe that I would be Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, we always forget about Bartholomew or any of the other disciples, on a bad day, I'm more like Judas, and on a good day, I'm more like Thomas. Our story begins exactly where we left off last Sunday. And normally, um, I'm a little hesitant to ask a congregation if they remember what the story was from the previous week, but I have faith in you. I know y'all are going to remember. What story did we hear last week? Yeah, thank you. Je oh, wow. <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead. Very good. I'm so relieved. Yes, we heard the Easter story. Uh, we had the foot race to the tomb, the folded grave clothes. Pastor Ben talked extensively about his experience doing laundry, and that is where we left things, right? And today, though we may be a week later in our own chronological sense of time, we're actually only a few hours later in the story. It's Easter night. The eggs have all been hunted. The ham has been, well, there was no ham. The lamb has been eaten. And the disciples are all tucked away in an upper room. In John's gospel, no one is really sure if Jesus is actually raised from the dead. Mary Magdalene is the only person who sees him in the garden. And despite the fact that you and I know that we can always and everywhere fully and completely trust the words of the women, the disciples are not entirely sure. So they're hidden away in a locked room. They're afraid that the religious authorities will come after them. They're not going to just stop at Jesus, and they're likely next. And this is a fear that's probably pretty justified. One commentator even suggests that they might be a little afraid to see Jesus themselves. I mean, after all, the last thing that they did uh, was fall asleep and run away and pretend like they didn't even know him and did absolutely nothing to help him at his crucifixion. They might feel like they're a bunch of chickens. Perhaps it's best if they stay hidden away so they can formulate a game plan for when they do run into him out on the streets of Jerusalem. But as we all know, a locked door is not a problem for the Son of God. Because Jesus just sort of appears in their midst. I grew up a Star Trek kid. Again, pastors are either cool or we're nerds. And, and I almost envisioned this moment not unlike various cast members beaming here, there, and everywhere on the TV show. Jesus just kind of beams himself into the locked room, and no one can believe it. He outstretches his hands. I imagine him lifting up his tunic to show the wound above his hip bone and below his rib cage, And no one can believe it's really him. Well, they eventually can believe that it is him, and they do believe it takes them a moment, and Jesus has to kind of remind them not to be afraid. But once the disciples collect themselves, they're all in. They believe. They have seen the risen Lord. Mary was right. He is alive. And he brought gifts, the gift of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing friend. And not only is he alive, 
and comes bearing gifts, but he has brought them their first assignment as his apostles post-resurrection. Did you catch it? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What a strange thing to say when first seeing your friends after you've been raised from the dead. I have to imagine that if my grandmother, who's been gone for 15 years, if she came back from the dead and beamed herself into my apartment here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, surely she would say something a little more personal, maybe a little more friendly. How about, I love you, I've missed you, or maybe even, good Lord, Kristen, what did you do to my kitchen table? <laughs> what a peculiar thing, Jesus says. Sin? See, referring to his deniers and his backstabbers, his cowardly friends who abandoned him, Peter who denied ever knowing him, Judas who betrayed him. What on earth is he talking about? And once more, he's missing Thomas. I mean, could he not wait for all of them to be together to give us this cryptic word? We don't even know where Thomas was or what he was doing, only that he was absent. Because as the text will tell us mere verses later, the disciples tell Thomas about this miraculous appearance upon his return, and he's not buying any of it. Unless I see evidence of those nails in his hands and that sword in his side, y'all have all lost your minds. But we know that they haven't lost it. You and I know that they haven't lost it. And soon Thomas comes to know too. This passage was used so much in my childhood and youth as a bludgeon for the doubters, for the skeptics, for the people whose brains work overtime and, and have a lot of questions. I know this because off and on in my life, I have been one of those overthinkers. And well-meaning people like Dieter F. Uchtdorf have told me to doubt my doubts. Just don't think so hard about it. Don't worry your pretty little head about these things. Everything's going to be fine. And when I say well-meaning, I really do mean well-meaning. These people love me. They want me to remain faithful. They want me to remain rooted in the gospel. But the gift of this passage of scripture is that Jesus and Thomas show us another way. A way to be faithful that doesn't involve stuffing your doubts behind the coats in your coat closet. Note that Jesus doesn't withhold himself from Thomas. He doesn't get all miffed in the heavenly places and say, oh, that Thomas and his doubts, I'll show him never to doubt me again. No, Jesus comes to Thomas, just like he came to all of his other beloved friends. He let Thomas in on the knowledge. He showed him that there was nothing to worry about. I think of this like a parent who crawls on their hands and knees in the middle of the night with a flashlight and pulls up the bed skirt to show their frightened child that there really are no boogeymen under the bed. Jesus lovingly takes Thomas's hand and places it in his hand, and takes his finger and places it in his side. Jesus isn't annoyed. He's not castigating his friend for not believing that he was raised from the dead. Something totally normal that happens every day, right? No, Jesus shows him the way to belief. He doesn't say, doubt your doubts, Thomas. He says, I know you are doubting, and that's okay. Here, look and believe. The sentence Jesus gives, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. It's not a dig at Thomas. I mean, for goodness sakes, just hours earlier, no one was listening to Mary Magdalene. The other ten disciples in the room were no more holy or righteous. They believed because they saw. And what a blessing it is to see and to believe. Not everyone who saw Jesus believed in him. So belief is always to be celebrated, no matter how it manifests itself. The risen Christ was not bludgeoning poor Thomas. No, he was blessing us. I mean, barring some unique spiritual experiences, I would guess that the vast majority of us in this room have not seen the risen Christ in flesh and blood with our own two eyes or put our hands into the physical wounds on his hands and his side. We have not beheld with our eyes the realness of his resurrected form, and yet we believe. 
uh, Dr. Daniel is fond of giving points out in staff meeting. I don't really know what we can redeem them for, but it's always very exciting when we get some. So I'm telling you now, give yourself some points. You believe, and yet you have not seen. Note that Jesus does not say, blessed are they who believe perfectly, unwaveringly, and who have no questions whatsoever, and yet have not seen. Our belief does not have to be perfect. And honestly, I think imperfect belief is a bit more fun. Please do not email the bishop and tell her I said that. (laughs) No, imperfect belief allows us to ask questions. And questions are fun. Questions are interesting. I think God delights when we use our gray matter to think and to explore and to be curious. Someone along the way asked a question of Paul's text and wondered why women can't be preachers. And believe me, I am very happy that they asked that question. At some point in our history, someone asked the question of why do we close our communion table to only the baptized and only members of our congregation? And couldn't Christ's converting grace be at work during such a meal with the unbaptized and the baptized alike? And again, I'm very glad that they asked that question. Good questions are what fuel the process of sanctification the process of becoming holy, the way that we become more and more like Jesus. And Jesus loved some good questions. I had a professor at Perkins, Dr. Ted Campbell, who taught Methodist history. And I will say at nine o'clock, I was a little ashamed to admit this in front of the former dean of my seminary, Bill Lawrence, who was sitting over here. Um, But our class often took great delight in getting Dr. Campbell off on what we called TED tangents because he was not only incredibly witty and hilarious, but he was also incredibly wise. And at some point during one of these classes, um, I don't even know how we got here, but he said something that I've never forgotten. And when talking about the purpose of theological education, he remarked that a good theological education takes the student and rattles their faith, shakes it up a little, and that's not a bad thing. Because the very nature of rattling faith means that there's something of substance inside that you can actually shake. You can't shake a faith that doesn't exist. It's just darn near impossible. And so aspiring to a faith that rattles is a noble ambition. So don't be afraid to be shaken, to be challenged, to be stretched a little, to ask all the questions. Those spiritual muscle pains you feel are the result of something being pulled and stretched and used that something is happening within you. And the fact that you have something to stretch and pull and use to begin with is a very good thing. There's no question under the sun that has not been asked of God. And as our Savior said, do not be afraid. I'll take it a step further and say, do not be afraid of your doubts. Do not be afraid of your questions. Don't doubt your doubts. Take them by the hand and walk with them. Listen to them, rattle around a little bit, and trust that the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead blesses you in your striving, blesses you in your struggling, and that you are blessed in your imperfect belief. And there is absolutely nothing, no locked door, no religious authorities, absolutely nothing can take that blessing away from you. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, we gather around this table, a table that was busted wide open by our risen Savior, that all may come and taste and see that the Lord is good. So I invite you to rise as you are able, as we join in the great Thanksgiving and prepare to partake in this holy meal. Friends, the Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and our joy to give thanks and praise, Lord God of heaven and earth, because you are continually renewing your work of creation and transforming it to show your glory through resurrection. With your touch, you transformed us from the dust of the earth, and you raised your people from slavery in Egypt. You bound them to you through your covenant on Sinai, and you made yourself known to them in exile and in the promised land. 
In the cross of Jesus, you take into yourself the scars of our sin, and in his resurrected body, you invite us to touch the wounds of your love. And so we gladly thank you with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing the hymn of your unending praise. Forgiving God, your son's disciples cowered behind locked doors, and yet in him you visited them on the evening of resurrection and breathed on them the spirit of peace. Breathe that Holy Spirit upon us now, that your church may know the power of your forgiveness, and these gifts of bread and of wine may be for us the body and blood of your son Jesus Christ, who had supper with his disciples, took the bread, and broke it and shared it with them and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and again, he gave you thanks and he shared it with them and said, take and drink of this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we proclaim, great is the mystery of our faith. intimate savior of our lives and cosmic ruler of the universe. In Jesus, you are the substance of things hoped for and the knowledge of things unseen. Visit any who struggle under the shadow of doubt. Minister among all of us who suffer beneath the claims of oppressive rule. Resurrect your children, your church, and your earth. Bless those who have not seen and yet believe and shape your wounded body, the church, to let the world see you through its scars. Lift every voice and sing your Easter story until the day when we all stand before your throne in eternal communion with one another and with you, ever one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As beloved children of God, we are bold to pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This bread which we break is a sign of Christ with us in this very moment. 
And this cup over which we give thanks is a pouring out of God's grace upon our lives that we might see and believe. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, this table does not belong to the United Methodist Church. It does not belong to Christ United Methodist Church. This table belongs to Jesus Christ. And with Christ as our host, all are welcome to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. You do not have to be a member of this church or any church. You are welcome to come. We have a basket at the center aisle with prepackaged communion elements. We know there's a lot of illness still floating around, so that might be more comfortable for you. We'll also have two stations where a server will take a piece of the bread, dip it into the cup, and hand it to you to commune in that way. As we make our final preparations, I invite our servers and our ushers to get into place.
let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able as we join in singing our closing hymn, Open Our Eyes, Lord. It can be found in The Faith We Sing, which is the smaller black book in the pew back, on page 2086, and uh, the words will come up on the screen. Sorry about that. This is what happens when you read an older version of your worship worksheet. Thank you for, for trucking along with us. A few announcements before we go this day. Uh, just a reminder that at the end of this month, April 27th, we will have our all church work day. There's going to be stuff for people to do inside, outside, stuff for kids to do, adults, you name it. We've got tasks that everyone can do. Um, don't let the work day part uh, sort of make you feel like this is going to be boring and tedious. I promise it's a great time to come. We laugh. We have a great time. It's a wonderful way to get to know people in your church community. A couple of other notes. Uh, you heard me mention the commitment cards. Uh, we are still welcoming those. If you've not turned it in yet, it is not too late. You're welcome to get those to us in the office. And also a word that Vacation Bible School registration is still open. If you have children in your life, maybe neighbors, grandkids, your own kids, um, that you would like to come and join the party this summer, this June with Christ UMC, we would love to have them. It's going to be a wonderful week here at the church. That's all I have by way of announcements, so hear this blessing as we go. Friends, you don't have to doubt your doubts. God is bigger than any questions you may ask, any doubts you may have. So go for this day to live a life of faith that rattles when it is shaken. And go for this day to see the risen Christ in all who you meet. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>